All right, in this video, we are discussing Christmas Tide or Christmas Time. I don't know about you, but my audio correct uh, kept trying to like make Christmas Tide Christmas Time. Are you implying we have a 20th century first autocorrect on our hands? <laughs> the, the first autocorrect of the 20th century with Anton Chekhov coming up. Why won't my typewriter work? <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to the Codex Cantina where I am Una. And I'm crypto with a C. <laughs> we are going heavy into detail on At Christmas Tide by Anton Chekhov as a part of our very Russian Christmas project. And as always, we start off the publication information and A Christmas Time Tide was published in 1900 and our version was translated by Constance Garnet. So why are we talking about Christmas stories? We are doing a very foreign Christmas along with our friend Christy Lewis over at Dostoevsky in Space. Probably very excited to do more Dostoevsky. So why are we doing this project? We are doing a very foreign Christmas. This year we are doing Russian short stories. The idea is... Check out the stories, music, food, drinks. Try to immerse ourselves a little bit in cultures. We're so used to just watching the same American Christmas movies over and over again. I think it's worth checking out other cultures. And maybe do they view this time of year maybe a little bit differently than how we do? Yeah, I think as Americans, we've come to the idea that Christmas is about family time and coming together and communicating and maybe repairing relationships. And we see that a lot of times in our Christmas stories, in our Christmas movies. When we go on and Netflix and we you know watch one of those Hallmark movies, it's like it gives us that warm, fuzzy feeling inside because dad and son who hated each other for so long mm -hmm. finally put mm -hmm. things aside and amend their relationship over a good family you know christmas dinner or something and in other stories and cultures it isn't necessarily always the case it's almost like christmas is a time for like scheduling repair or scheduling relationship building time we're so focused on other things in the other parts of our lives that during this one month or this one time period we become so obsessed with that goal in mind so for plot four years have passed since a daughter has been wedded her mother has received but two letters from her and has grown restless she pays an ex-military man named yegor to write a letter upon her behalf he injects military doctrine writing into the letter, reads it back to them, and they agree to send it off. <laughs> <laughs> okay. In part two, the husband gets the letter that they had sent and gives it to his wife, who's ecstatic to hear from her family. Now, at the same time, he starts to recall, oh, yeah, my wife gave me some letters I was supposed to send to, to her mom and dad. Whoops. <laughs> <laughs> And interestingly enough, she cowers in fear from her husband as she's raising the three children that they have. End plot. Which kind of uh, kind of feels like, is there... I feel like the natural reaction for me is kind of like, is there a part three? Did, did we cut part three like we did in the bet? Like, <laughs> Yeah, you think this is where, again, you would come into that American idea of, oh, there's going to be a third part redemption where they find the letters and there's some magical thing about them where they're, oh, you get millions of dollars and you have this happy ending where you live ever after. And no, there is no third part. That's the end of the story. Well, we have the same problem, though, right? They both long for communication. And I think we see a couple different representations of that in this story. Interestingly enough, the father, you know, the husband of, of the mother that starts with the story can't write. Writing being a major form of communication. Obviously much more common today than it was in 1900, but that still is symbolic that he is unable to communicate in that way. Yeah, I think this is where we start to see a major problem and breakdown in the communication because when you rely on someone else to communicate for you, especially with this military man, you don't know what information is going to be conveyed. And that's very disastrous, especially if you can't read yourself. He could put something in there that is misleading or misconstruing or just simply flat out as a lie. Well, and we see that the man is really not interested in their story. He starts inserting like military doctrine into their letter. And, you know, here's here's the the, the mother and husband, well, mother and father, who are relying on this man to convey their feelings and experiences to this daughter, a time of reconnecting Christmas tide, right? And they're just like, okay, looks good when he reads the letter back to them. Like, that's... It's absurd to me. Yeah, it's kind of crazy <laughs> to think that, that that would be okay because somebody, I think, in our culture would say, no, 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 no. We need a little bit more emotion in there. This is me trying to rekindle, reconnect with somebody that I love, 
and you're putting it off like it's a manual for a, a, a toaster oven, you know, and it's like, no, there, there's more to it than this. I can see like a very modern reinterpretation of this with like, they'd be like, P.S., I love you. And he's just like doodling a little grenade <laughs> or like a military <laughs> bayonet. <laughs> Oh, no, the modern version of this would be just like, oh, we'll throw a heart emoji at the end. It'll be okay. <laughs> now, when we flip over into Act 2 with the husband, it's interesting. It's very passing and quick, but he's reminding the general what's in this room. It's the massage room, and they say he does this every day. And I think this is further tacking on to the concept of communication where he's communicating with this general every day, but the general isn't receiving. He's kind of forgetting it. Communication isn't happening here, is it? Yeah, and I think that brings back to the point that we've talked about in many stories before when we have this dynamic between people is that the biggest mistake of communication is assuming that it happened. And I've stolen that quote before from my wife, and it isn't happening here. It's comparable even into a sense. Right now, we're in the middle of this pandemic of 2020. People have these masks. So my facial res- my facial like reactions and micro expressions are hidden as we're talking. We're even missing out on various forms of communication with these masks. Same things happening in a sense with 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 what's happening with this letter. All they're getting is written doctrine of military orders as opposed to true communication and true rekindling of relationships. We have a massive fail. <laughs> to, to, oh, for sure. To reconnect here. <laughs> And I think there's there's two points there. One is that with like the masks and with the letter is that some things uh, will not be conveyed because unintentionally not seeing them, but also that you purposely won't convey them. People have those masks on or you have to write something in a letter, you might put it down. And the second point is that when you're writing, there's not necessarily a direct tone to it, especially in a military type doctrine. You can add some flowery language to it, but still it's hard to sometimes convey a tone or a feeling to writing. That's why we do this channel is to try to pull those meanings out because sometimes it's difficult to do even for the best of us. I'm still picturing this military man, like, instead of, like, an eye with a dot, he does an eye with, like, a little grenade for the dot. <laughs> you and these freaking grenades. All right. Okay. Can we make them at least something Christmassy, like a little snowflake <laughs> <laughs> over the eye? All right. So let's let's talk about the husband. What do you think is the deal with him forgetting to send the letters upon his wife's behalf? Yeah, I think that when communication isn't personal, when it's done in this manner, it's easy to just not care about it at all and just be like, meh, it's nonchalant to him. When I am passionate about something, I will pour my heart and effort into it, dotting my eyes with grenades. And when I don't care about it, yeah, when I... (laughs) When I don't care about it, you just get a little period, right? <laughs> if, if, if anything at all, right? Or you can forget. Sorry, I'm, I'm making jokes here at your point. You actually had a good point there about when it's not personal, you tend not to care. Uh, we need to talk about the daughter. Is the daughter okay here? Because we have these quotes that, where she's, she kind of kicks it off saying, they are warm-hearted in the country. They are God-fearing. And then when, and when her husband, Andre, comes in, she was very much frightened of him. Oh, how frightened of him. She trembled and was reduced to terror by the sounds of his steps, by the look in his eyes, and dared not utter a word in his presence. She is not exactly in a safe place. No, this is like the scariest Santa Claus you could possibly imagine and being forced to sit on his lap. (laughs) Well, this this makes me wonder. I mean, he didn't send how many letters to her parents they don't even know that she has kids she's got three kids i mean we can bet money that she at least wrote home to tell her parents we had a kid right i'm on my third one now right yeah true well i think this is the husband using control to limit communication here and this is a form of either uh, it doesn't imply you know any physical abuse but obviously there's some type of emotional abuse or some type of abuse going on in this family from the husband to the wife it seems to me she's powerless to re- this story is about communication and reconnecting right she is yeah. powerless to do that in the face of someone who doesn't care i think she's i think that he's making her terrified uh for this relationship and that 
that there is no reciprocation of love in this relationship. There is no communication. It's been broken down this relationship. And her one goal is to repair the relationship she, she has left with her family, with her parents. Yeah, it's sometimes terrifying to reach out and not get a response, right? Like, isn't she even also just being, a? maybe even she's just worried about her parents. Like, why aren't my parents writing back to me? I've sent all of these letters. Isn't it scary to reach out and not receive reciprocal love in a sense too, I guess, is, is one way that I would look at it. Yeah, and that it it takes a lot of effort and courage, and maybe that's kind of the point of the story, is that even though it may not be reciprocated, you should always try to move forward and repair those relationships. So there is kind of that glimmer of hope if you're really looking for it. It is there, but it's very subtle. Well, and then we get to these last line of the story. What did you take from that one? Yeah, so I think Chekhov's implying kind of a double meaning here with the, uh, and I quote, uh, Chakot Duché, I think is how you say it. I really don't know. But this is a, a restorative bath that was intended to stimulate vascular and lymphatic systems. And... Uh, so he's trying to heal, uh, it, 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 heal the relationship, heal the sick-hearted daughter. Uh, he's trying to repair everything at the end. So it's kind of cool, the double meaning. I really like how he ends it, even though it's not a happy ending. So all of this is kind of leading to Chekhov writing this story about wanting to restore relationships. But he chose Christmas specifically, right? Like a time of rebirth. I just, I wonder what was it that, that made Chekhov choose this to be a Christmas story. I think it's interesting that you used to use the word rebirth here because a lot of times in many cultures, Christmas time, that winter is is a time of death and we're hoping for rebirth. And believe it or not, Chekhov was was dying and he knew that he was dying. He had been a, a practicing medical doctor in in his time in his life and he knew that he was was dying. And I think this is his kind of way of communicating uh, maybe he's trying to redeem himself here through this story. And I quote, Chekhov found uh, coughing blood and in 1886 the attack worsened, but he would not admit his tuberculosis to his family or his friends. Uh, mm. So he, he's dying of tuberculosis, and I think this is his way of getting a, through that and communicating to his family what was happening to him. Well, 86, that's 14 years before the story was even written. So his condition, he was... I don't... What year did he die? Do you know what year he died? Yeah, he dies in 1904, so just a mm. few years after this story is published. Okay. I can see this. He's He's a man that knows that he's dying maybe wanting to restore okay you said that he didn't tell his family i think this is his confession right this is his swan mm. song yeah his regret song yeah. even in a sense too yeah right? i wish oh I, yeah i like I, that that's good i wish i had reached out and taken advantage of talking to loved ones interesting yeah. So some people enjoy these conversations but aren't sure what to comment down below. Feel free to leave a pen or a pencil down below if you'd like to help contribute to our channel. We have a playlist down below as well if you would like to check out other conversations that we've had on Checkoff. Crypto, let's move into our subjective ratings. What are you going to give this one? I think I'm being a little bit unfair on this one because it felt the kind of most Christmassy and the most uplifting of all, even though it doesn't have a great happy ending. I think that knowing a lot about Checkoff and what he was trying to do with this story... Uh, I got a lot out of it as kind of Christmassy values, so to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, so overall, I think there's a lot here analytically with communication, which I love, which we've talked about. And we could even compare this to other stories mm -hmm. in, in a sense. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I enjoyed what was going on in the story. A little bleak, but I could give this one probably a solid 7.7. .7. No, seven, seven point zero. <laughs> Sorry, I wanted to say just seven, <laughs> seven. <laughs> All right, I'm gonna one up you. I'm gonna give the story an eight. I would agree that this is probably as uplifting as, as Russian Christmas stories could get, right? Yeah, exactly. Check out the book. So pretty. Well, all right, guys, if you enjoyed conversations like this and would like to have some more, we post videos every Monday and Thursday with bonus videos on Tuesdays. If that sounds like you. Please consider hitting that subscribe button. Una out. Peace.